I think three total lineups out of all the ones I played in the green, but one of them was my biggest win and, uh, it was enough for over 5k. And, uh, so obviously I'm thrilled because like I said, it's the biggest one I've ever had, but it's one of those where you kind of, you, you got it. Anyone who's just playing one lineup with NASCAR, they're, they're rolling a big dice. If you hit awesome, you're going to hit, but man, that's risky. You got to diversify. I think most people saw this coming at some point in the season. I don't think anyone expected Kyle Larson to win the fourth race of the year. I knew he was going to win in 2021. I didn't think it would come as quick, quickly as it did, but Las Vegas, people make some, uh, some bets. He didn't really have to make a bet. He pretty much dominated that race. He led 103 laps, ultimately got the win. Hendrick looked good throughout. He looked great. Sum it up. It's a it's a great all around day for Kyle Larson. He has been popping up on my radar radar all year because there's been a point. I mentioned this in the last podcast. There seems like there was a point in every race so far this year. Uh, he looked like he was going to be the best car and and late in the race. It wasn't oh he, looked, he led the first couple laps. N- nothing like that. He was. He's been so dialed in this year, and it has flat out impressed me. Never been the biggest Har- um, uh, Kyle Larson fan. Thought he was a little overhyped, but now I'm starting to understand why people are so high on him. And he doesn't even have full sponsorship yet in, in his cup ride, and he's already in victory, victory lane. Yeah, if he continues to rack up wins, and we saw Bubba come and congratulate him right afterwards, and that was a huge step in the right direction for, for NASCAR. For everything. Brad went out on the track. And congratulated it, him. It was just a good moment for in, for the sport of NASCAR. It was. I think. It really was. It was just what it's all about, and it's something that NASCAR needs. It's what we all need, and it was just great to see a comeback story, him do it so quickly because he is so talented. He's a great driver, and to get back in the saddle and to just pretty much go on a tear through the first four races and get that win so quickly, you get, you've got to bet on him. you you got to Honestly, I think if you're some of the competition around him, you, I think you got to be a little worried at this point. Not just him, Hendrick as a whole. I mean, William Byron, he won the race before, Homestead. He looked good. Obviously, Chase Elliott's the defending champion. He was up front, had a crazy little 360 spin out, um, and still was able to keep going. Um, Alex Bowman was running really good, almost destroyed his car and uh anthony alfredo's trying to get to pit road because i think he had a tire go down or something but he was up front you know the finish doesn't reflect that but man hendrick up to this point you know last year i think at, at this point we were saying okay penske's the strong team uh stewart haas is the strong team gibbs didn't was a little off even though denny had won they weren't quite there Hendrick was not there at the beginning of the season last year. They are dialed in right now. Yeah, and Penske's not too far off, but man, you you just hit hit it on the head. It's it's another beast whenever you're looking at what Hendrick's how they're performing on the track. And, and I just want to say this real quick: at the road course, the caution, the rainbow that brought out the caution late in the race because of a little couple drizzles. Uh, Elliot was dominating that race. He had a good lead, been leading a bunch of laps. If that doesn't turn out the way that it does, Hendricks got three wins in a row. And then you have the uh, Michael McDowell win to open the season at a, a, a super speedway, so it could have been anybody. Which Chase finished second <clears throat> there. It's just, uh, we'll see how, if they'll be able to maintain this dominance throughout the year. Most teams will get it figured out. I, I expect Joe Gibbs to be uh, much better uh, at some point this year. I'm a little worried about Stuart Haas, to be honest, because I'm not seeing a lot. Um, I'm sure Harvick will start to gather himself up at some point, too. But um, Penske, like you said, they're there. Uh, Brad has, and really Joey, but uh, Brad has been right there, too. Brad got a second-place finish this last week, and it's just he seems to always be in the conversation. And it's Penske power, 
you would expect Joey to, if he doesn't have a couple of little hiccups along the way, he's right there with them. So uh, we'll see if Blaney kind of can kind of continue his uh, Get a good race. Yeah, his little streak this week and see if it all comes together for him. Because right now, yeah, you've 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 said it. Hendrick really does have a lot of power right now, and they seem to be and the class of the field. All three drivers are in uh, were in the top ten. Uh, Brad was second, Blaney was fifth, and Logano was ninth. Pretty powerful. Yeah. So uh, at this point, Hendrick is number one. Penske's two. Um, I, I guess Joe Gibbs would be three because Christopher Bell does have a win. Stuart Haas is – they do look, in my opinion, a little bit in trouble. Yeah, because we were really high on Kevin Harvick uh, going into this past week in Vegas, and he really didn't perform. It's kind of a tale of – some of the stuff we looked at, it just didn't kind of play out the way we expected. It's NASCAR, but diversity in lineup builds is key, especially. I, I think this is the second race at Vegas where Harvick was on the pole and did not lead a single lap. It's it's and finished twentieth. Is it, is it a Stuart Haas problem? Is it horsepower? What are we looking at? I'm not a hundred percent sure, but it's got you kind of concerned now. A little bit. Uh, His teammates haven't looked too great. I mean, Chase Briscoe's, he's a rookie. You you don't know what you're going to get. Cole Custer, he got that win. um, So he's got a little bit more pressure on them, I think, to perform. But he's still a second. Yeah, Yeah, well, yeah, last year. And um, he's, uh, it's his second year. So really, the next veteran guy is Amarola. And hey, he had a little issue. It's NASCAR, things happen. But he didn't really look that good in the race either and hasn't looked great this year. Yeah, because we were really high on Eric Almirola last week. And he, Screwed me. He had, <laughs> he had a, a, a tire blow out and ended up in the wall. And next thing you know, he's finishing what? Was it last place or close to – he finished dead last place. So and he was starting, what, like 30th or something? I mean, he had almost zero downside, and yet somehow he managed to screw anybody who rostered him in DraftKings. And I know – if you look at uh, this weekend, Jeremy, you had a heck of a win. And if you look at it overall, it really was only because one or two lineups performed. It wasn't because of just you were all over a driver and all your lineups cashed. And that's some of why we're here and want to talk about some of what transpired so we can help everybody that's watching understand a little bit more. Yeah, it was a, a really... Honestly, kind of a weird feeling because normally uh, if I'm positive in money or at least make uh, my my entry fees back, it's spread out over the course of several lineups. There's usually one that kind of is taking the bulk of it, but most of it's – you're seeing quite a few in, in the green. I only had, I think, three total lineups out of all the ones that I played in the green, but one of them was my biggest win, and – uh it was enough for over 5k and uh so obviously i'm thrilled because like i said it's the biggest one i've ever had but it's one of those where you kind of you you got it anyone who's just playing one lineup with nascar they're they're rolling a big dice if you hit awesome you're gonna hit but man that's risky you gotta diversify because like you said most of my lineups didn't even they weren't good a lot of them had amarola and some other guys who just didn't and uh, harvick they just didn't do what we thought and that's nascar yeah and i went and i diversified as i typically try to do and whenever i say diversify i have a different core um lineup spread throughout and then i'll pick and choose drivers to fill out uh, the rest of the lineup to kind of make it a little bit different so you're not stacking a 90 percent almarola lineup so whenever he crashes you're pretty much screwed from the get-go so Trying to not have overexposure on a driver is is key, but at the same time, you want to make sure that uh, you, if you're really high on somebody, that you have them throughout enough to where you're comfortable with it and confident in it. But it, it's NASCAR at the end of the day. All it takes is what we saw with Eric Almirola, yep. blow a tire. You had all the upside in the world to start the race and Harvick. Yeah, and you now finish dead last and everything's out the window. So it really is impactful. And you can see if you have uh, any lineups that had Eric Almirola, you're probably towards the bottom of the cash pool at that yeah. point. But the good thing about it is it, it wasn't every once in a while just to kind of 
play the other side. I, I'll go against. I'll, I'll put some guys that we're not always high on, just because it's like one or two lineups. You never know. It's NASCAR. But the guys that actually got me this nice win were all guys that we talked about. Weren't the highest on, but we mentioned them and we were positive on them. Ryan Blaney was in there. Obviously, Kyle Larson was the top dog. Uh, I wish I had gone a little heavier on Larson, um, but he was starting third. So it was one of those you're like, well, is this going to be a Harvick race? Is this a Logano race? Is this a Chase race? It was tough. William Byron, he was starting eighth, coming off a win. Uh, Sorry, he finished eighth, but he started second. That's really hard to want to play those guys, but we liked them. We mentioned them. Christopher Bell, another guy we were pretty high on. Uh, there were, he was kind of sandwiched in some people that we liked a little bit more, just a little bit better upside. He was in there. Eric Jones, he made it because of our projections, but you were way higher on Eric Jones than I was, but because we build our projections together, uh, he ended up in this lineup. And then the last guy is Chris Busher, which started 18th. We liked him. We've liked what we've seen weren't expecting to have a, uh, a a showing like he had at Homestead, but it was enough to, like I say, get me a nice finish. And that lineup that you just spit out and ended up winning you 5500 bucks, in no way would I ever even comprehend playing that in a cash game scenario. So when we say cash game, we're talking single entry type uh, plays or 50-50 uh, really, it's 50-50 head-to-head kind of contest where you're playing cash games and you've got a really good opportunity to get your money back and double it. So you really want to be kind of... It's it's safer. You just don't have that same high upside as you do in the other tournaments, which we will get to. Um, but they are a great way to build a bankroll it's a great way to build your bankroll because it's a little bit safer as you will um, because more of the field cashes you're also less likely to have a bigger payday because it's typically only doubling your money right so it's how seasoned players typically manage their bankroll and continue to be able to have money week in and week out to play with then the lineup that jeremy was uh, able to cash in on that was in a what we call GPP tournament. It's a big player pool. Um, like 59,000 entries or something like that. Yeah, there's a lot of... Uh, and the sizes of the contest vary. They, the, the tournament can be from 2,000 players all the way up to 100, 300,000, if not more players. And it's kind of like the lottery. You have to be a little bit different. You are looking to stand out. But at the same time, you have to understand that you need a solid core that you're banking on and then being able to sprinkle the drivers to be a little bit different throughout and being diverse in that helps you kind of spread the uh, uh, law of averages out to potentially have a better payday. That's one of the reasons I think I've taken two NASCAR. One, I'm a NASCAR uh, DraftKings, I should say. Obviously, I'm a fan of the sport. I like it. But it really does play differently than NFL or NBA or some of these other really big, uh, even uh, PGA. They just play different. And in at least in my experience, obviously, any any given day, you could just hit it right, just like the lottery, and it doesn't matter. You uh, There was a guy... You'll remember this uh, last year, I think sometime, he played one lineup in a PGA contest and got first. And I don't even think he'd ever played before. Something like that. One million bucks. Million dollars. Insane. Those things can happen, but they don't happen very often. And in the NFL and NBA, a lot of times you're going up against guys who they're into these sports. They're going to watch it way more than probably anybody watching this video like if you're a casual fan, you're going up against guys like this is their living. They are looking into this data all day, every day, and they know who's sick, who stubbed their toe. Like they just know things that you don't, and they just know how to diversify their lineups enough. They're going to beat you most times. NASCAR, no one can predict when someone's going to have a tire go flat. No one's going to be able to predict when someone's going to speed on pit road or get loose or someone behind them. They don't know if Joey Logano is going to do a bump and run on them or something crazy like that. You, you can 
take really good educated guesses based on previous data, what you're seeing in the season, and that's what we do here. But at the end of the day, you can't protect or predict everything, and so you have a nice shot to finish high in a tournament. And that's what we're here for is to kind of elaborate on who we're higher on this week versus who we were high on last week because it really does matter week to week because like last week, Las Vegas, some of the guys that we were high on then, we're not going to be so high on this week because it's a different style track. It's a different type of racing and the strategy is different because Mm. at a track like we were at last week, there's a lot more laps, a lot more potential for laps led and performance points. And even if you started in the back, you had an ability to work your way towards the front. This week, going to Las Vegas or to Phoenix, it's a mile long tra- or a mile track, a lot more compact, a lot more difficult to pass. And one of the things that really stuck out to me as I was going through stuff is Jeff Gordon famously quoted that this track rewards experience. So a lot of things that we just learned and talked about. I think kind of get summarized into this race. This is why they've made this race a champion, the championship race now Mm -hmm. is because the final four last year, that's all that mattered is the guys with experience guys in the situation that needed to win. And this is that track. So things change this week and I'm excited for it. There's uh, and the thing you, um, also got to note, too, there's more laps. There's not a ton more laps, but there's a little bit more laps in this race. Mm-hmm. So that means guys who are going to lead laps, like they're going to be worth more. Guys who get more fastest laps, they're worth more. Uh, track position is key, but you don't necessarily have to be up front because they reconfigured this track. Um, I think they finished at the end of October of 2018. So they had a race a month later was the first one. And uh, what they did is they basically moved the starting line from one side to the other. And I think they made the grandstand and all the concessions. Like they just, it's apparently an awesome facility now. But what used to be turn three and four is now turn one and two. And what that means is there's a dog leg to the left and there's no out of bounds. And we've, we'll see it. Um, we saw it last year and we'll see it at every race four five six wide on the restarts it's not always going to work out for everybody but you have options you are not stuck behind the guy that's in front of you and and that's typically on restarts that you get that quick advantage and you really have to capitalize on it right then and there because if once they start getting to getting around going full speed it's it's a tough place to pass and you really have to know how to pass here or you'll end up dinging somebody. Get, tires are going to be an issue. Just the tire rip wear from bang, bumping and banging a little bit at a shorter track. Um, so there's going to be a lot of a lot of things that uh, are Tempers. in the mix. You got to got to tempers. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, guys are going to be. It's it, it's not a true like short short track, but it's one where you, if you can't get around someone, you might dump them. And we have seen this before. Yep. And the two guys that are going to be calling the race in Clint Boyer and Jeff Gordon got in a skirmish, I think, back in 2012. And this is where they're, uh, I guess, now infamous. Uh, it was actually pretty lighthearted fun. But they got into a skirmish, uh, and it was pretty exciting. Something to take a back or a trip back and look at on YouTube for sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you definitely need to... Uh, well, at this point, I think they've showed enough replays on all their promo videos, <laughs> so people probably know exactly what we're talking about. Uh, but it is a good race. It's a fun race. It's not my favorite track that they go to, but um, uh, it's, like you said, it, experience is really going to be keys, and uh, that's what I think we're really going to be, uh, some of the drivers are going to be honing in on. So do you want to kind of fill people in on the, the race preview, let them uh, know about the length and some of the lap details and what we're looking at? Well, like we said, there's more laps this week. Uh, last week there was uh, 267. We were bumping that up to 312. But it's only a mile and a half, so I, I kind of think unless we get a bunch of cautions, um, might be a little bit quicker quicker race. We'll see. It's NASCAR. I don't know. Uh, but you mentioned it is a mile long. Um, that leaves about 218.4 p- uh, potential performance points, which are laps led and fastest laps. 
the stages. First stage is 75 laps. There'll probably be a competition caution. Have you seen anything? It's I have not. Like it has 20, a, it's probably going to be about 30 laps, I would imagine, yeah, 30, 35. As of right now, when we're recording this, that hasn't been announced, and also there obviously hasn't been tech. So that's something right. that people, if you're listening now, we release a uh, quick race rundown on Sunday morning, and that's usually uh, available to us at that point. Right. Uh, so first stage is 75 laps. Um, like I said, there'll be a competition caution in there somewhere. Uh, 115 laps for the second stint, so a little bit longer, um, a little longer green green flag run most likely in that second stage. And then the third stage, there's 122 laps. So a strategy question for you. Since this race is a mile long racetrack and 312 laps, is this something that if somebody fails tech, are you completely fading them? Or how are you approaching that? Because we've seen it with Denny Hamlin a couple of weeks ago where he was at, at the front, got dropped to the dropped to the back. We weren't too concerned about it. Yeah, and I think he got back up there, but he, did, uh, he didn't do quite as well. But it's a very valid question. And my answer this week, and it will that type of question is going to change track to track, week to week. This race, it's in my opinion, really dependent on the situation and who the driver is, because anyone who may have been watching last year, Chase Elliott, you know, this is a championship race. Chase Elliott was one of the final four. He was the only one of the four who failed tech, had to go to the rear, drove through the field, and still dominated the race. Obviously, other guys led for portion two, um, so. It, it, it's situational. Uh, I think a guy like if Chase Elliott were to drop to the rear, or maybe even Larson or Brad Kay, some, some, someone like that, some of these higher tier teams, and if they really are fitting nicely into your lineups and you're happy with them there, keep them. Because there's plenty of times for them to get back on the uh, right uh, schedule with the competition caution, 75 laps at first stage. Um I would keep them, but if it's someone who's been struggling, um, probably, probably not. Yeah. And I'm agreeing with you. It's, it's one of those where it really depends on who it is, but it's one of those guys that if you're looking in the ballpark of $9,300 and up, I think those are all key guys that you really want in your lineup, no matter the situation, because they are really the class of the field, in my opinion. And we're getting ready to dive into the rundown here. Um, but strategy is key. And we want, I know from some of the feedback we've received that there's a lot of new players that are getting into DraftKings. We talked about it in some of our first episodes to start the preseason before we went into this that NASCAR is really captivating a new audience. And there's a lot of new players, and we want to help that along. So, um, if we want to hear from them too along the way. And if there's anybody listening that has questions, interact with us. That's yeah. what we're here for. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, obviously comment on YouTube or uh, shoot us a message, comment on a post on Twitter or shoot us a direct message. That's fine too. Um, and just to kind of paint a picture uh, of the question that you asked, if, and as the scenario, most of these guys up at the front, like you said, these higher price guys, you're probably going to leave them alone. Maybe, lower their ownership a little bit but like a guy and we'll get to him but a guy like someone if you if if he's a mid-tier guy like a uh, austin Dillon, and you're just really liking the way that he's coming in fitting into the lineups you can get everyone else that you want and he's had a decent season if he fails tech i'm pulling him from every single lineup because he might finish 10th 11th 12th if uh, you know mo- more than likely that's only a couple of positions PD, and he has so many guys he'd have to pass just to get to that. You lose any sort of real upside, in my opinion. You're only asking for damage from another car getting a tire cut down because you're racing against other guys. So uh, just as an example, if someone was wanting that, that would be this week, that would be a guy that I would probably pull from every lineup. Yeah, so I think we've really touched on a lot of the things that we wanted to talk about before we get into the driver. So are you ready to dive into it? And let's just go over some of the information that we really dug deep for this week. Yeah, let's um, switch over here. I don't know if I really want to talk about this guy because, like we mentioned uh, earlier, he uh, he kind of he burned a lot of people, I think. Uh, a lot of people, I think, are going to be salty um, with this first guy, Kevin Harvick, at 
11,900. And this might be the right time to go and play a lot of Harvick because he's starting 18th. He's starting 18th. He has a lot of upside in place differential, but you just look at the track history here alone. Nine. Nine, nine. wins. Yep. Nine. Count yep. that. Nine yep. wins. Just in the last six races here, his worst finish is ninth. So he only has one win in that time frame, but he's just a consistent performer here. But we were both talking about that earlier in the episode, how Stuart Haas equipment just hasn't been there yet. Is that something that's going to make you a little leery of playing him this week? Because we really haven't got to talk about it too much on where yeah. where Harvick fits into this. I, I it's tough because I want to I want to be able to build some lineups and and tweak some stuff to kind of see how he fits in there. Because on paper he's in a great spot. Um, I watched the NASCAR uh, pit road selection, and uh, they had a veteran on there, um, and he 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 was okay with Harvick's pit selection because he had like the 18th pick. Or something like that. Um, so he, all the good spots, all the clean entries and outs were already taken, of course. And that's key now, whenever you're looking at it from a strategic point, trying to get in and out of the pit po- or pit stall. Well, this you, is a big a, a track. You got to be, you got to nail pit road. Chase Elliott almost lost a championship because his pit road guys made him almost made a mistake. Um, you, you, I mean, every track is important on pit road but some are just a little hard, harder and short tracks especially there's no room for error he is going to be in between the double zero and another car similar to the double zero so they shouldn't be too much of a factor for Harvick but I can't say the same for the rest of the Stuart Haas guys they are going to be dealing with guys potentially blocking them into the pit or disrupting their entry into the pit it could be a really struggle for that team uh Stuart Haas as a whole but Harvick I think is gonna be okay in that regard I think he lucked out um I don't know man I just on paper like you said he is really good here and he's in such a great spot but he has not shown that what I would typically want to see from Harvick well he's got so many good stats that pop out to you here that even with his average finish of 4.8 getting fifth he's got the fifth most laps led in the six race or six race span here it doesn't even with that price tag starting so far back if we give him the estimated average finish of fifth and then cutting out his or cutting his laps led and fastest laps basically in half you still are able to attain 5x value so he with his dominance here in previous years and just Knowing how Kevin Harvick seems to be consistent with most of his finishes, it seems like a track that I don't want to fade him by any stretch of the imagination. No, you, um, again, it comes down to what kind of game style are you playing? Um, are you doing those single entries? Are you doing uh, the 50-50s, the double-ups? If you are, I mean, I personally would favor Harvick more because you can fit some other good guys in there. And you go and look at our race guide this week, and you we always put in three core lineups into to, into our race guide in the uh, the driver pool section. He's in our cash core lineup this week because he is in such a great position. Even though we have some concerns, the yeah. the downside is just so minimal. Even with the high price tag, right. the, the upside is still great. Right, I like to play a little bit more tournament style so for me i'm having a little bit trouble just because i don't know exactly how the rest of these guys are going to fit in with them because of the almost twelve thousand dollar price tag but almost any time you can get harvick starting 18th at a track that he has multiple wins at uh you gotta you gotta like it at least a little bit yeah and now you look at kevin harvick Former champion multiple times. Now we're going into Chase Elliott, the new champion that won his championship here at this track. 11-5 starting sixth. He's in an interesting spot. Yeah. Um, I yeah, I think he could be the, the top dog here. But he's going to have to be better than in my opinion brad and probably larson again because i think both have good track history here they're both in really good uh positions 
He, so you I, just I, basically gave away your three top plays. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's that's what most of the data is kind of pointing to. Now, there's another guy we will get to here in a second that I didn't mention there that uh, is a little riskier, but that's my biggest concern with Chase Elliott is he needs to – he'll get fastest laps. That's the kind of driver he is. That's the type of equipment they have. But he has to lead laps for it to really pay off this price tag. And in my opinion, the two guys that are going to be – potentially the, the two main dudes are Brad and, and Larson. That's my only biggest concern with Elliot. And you mentioned the price tag being 11,500. He's going to need some performance points and that's laps led and fastest laps. He has the third most fastest or third most laps led here behind Kyle Busch and Joey Logano in the last six races. So he knows how to get around the track here. He's very good at what he does, obviously as the former champion, Three top tens, two top fives. He even last spring had a loose wheel in stage two, got the free pass, and was able to finish third. So he knows how to get around this place. So I'm I I want to have a decent bit of chase, but we need to see him pay that price tag and reach value, and that's only with the performance points. Those laps led. And fastest laps because he doesn't have a lot of upside with the place differential. But he does have arguably the best crew chief in the game right now, Alan Gustafson. So, um, and a great pit crew. And like I already said, Hendrick is on fire. Uh, this could be a Chase Elliott day. This could be the day where he just gets that first win of the year, third win in a row for um, uh, Hendrick Motorsports and back to back wins at Phoenix. Uh, but I do think it's difficult based on some of the other guys that we've seen so far this year. But, yeah, Elliott is in my player pool for sure. Going down the list to uh, Joey Logano, Team Penske, 11-1. Starting ninth, he has a little bit more upside in place differential, a little bit lower price tag. He's somebody that we were really high on last week. He had a had a great place uh, or finishing spot, um, but not like domination like we were expecting. Um, a little bit of a letdown. A little bit of a letdown. He's got an average finish of 13th here. There's some stuff that we like about him. You want to point it out? Well, he won this race last year. That's a pretty good start. Um, uh, in Since they reconfigured this race in the spring, his average finish is 5.5, including that win. Um, obviously, that's not the biggest sample size, but this track does seem to... You know, touching quickly back on on Harvick, and the reason why I'm bringing this up, Harvick hasn't been quite as well done, quite been quite as dominant since they reconfigured. It's essentially the same track. It's just they relocated the start finish line. But I think it's worth noting, and and Logano, he's been good all around, but he really has done really well with this new setup. Because to your point, and something that stuck out to me, which originally made me not so high on him, is out of the last 10 races here, four times he's finished not on the lead lap. Yeah. But since they've reconfigured it, his stats have kind of gone the other direction. Yeah. Which you're pointing out right now. Right. And in the fall, uh, let's see, where is he at? In the If you take away the championship race, because I feel like including championship numbers in that race, is it might be okay for those – particular drivers that were in the championship but in my opinion it's not really fair because they are not getting raced the same way they are on most tracks when the guys are like well i'm not going to ruin a championship race for these guys so if you if you take that out and you just look at the last two fall races since they reconfigured uh not as good for logano he has struggled some Uh, average finish is 23 um but he does have one top 10 out of those two races so uh, it seems like he is better here in the spring, and to your point, he is better here since they reconfigured. Um, so, and with what we've seen from Penske, maybe this is a Logano race, whereas last week was kind of more dialed in for Brad. Uh, obviously, time will tell, but I, I like Logano a lot. It's going to be really hard to uh, get all these guys in here because essentially from the top guy down to practically almost the 9,000 range I want to have exposure to. Yeah, no, it's it's going to be difficult to pick because you <laughs> you look where Joey Logano is starting ninth. He has the upside that you're looking for. So it's going to be difficult to fit 
who you want, and it's why we really talked about strategy to open this up. We want diversity, and this week will really be a week where you can diversify with a lot of these top guys. It's going to be very interesting to see what the field does with this next guy. Because if there's one guy, if you're just looking at who's the best active driver at Phoenix, just overall, uh, well, obviously you have to say Harvick because he's won here nine freaking times. But I think a close second is Kyle Busch. Will you go look at the stats Kyle Busch puts up here? I just almost died. Like, he has 11 Xfinity wins here. 11. Yeah. 11. And then he's got two cup wins, and both those have came in the last six races. So he's got just insane stats here. He's average finish of 3.3. He's led the most laps. There's just one bullet point after another after another of stats this guy has been able to put up here. So I'm I'm torn because we haven't seen a whole bunch of consistency with Kyle Busch, but it's Kyle Busch. Finished third last week. And it's looking up. I picked him in our predictions episode to win this race prior to the season getting underway. So I'm going to look at him a little bit more than most, I think. He's been a guy that's been priced way up there. Yeah, you get a, a little salary relief. But the problem, he, Kyle, he, he finished second, or excuse me, th- I believe it was third in this spring race last year. And we all, anyone who watched any NASCAR last year knows he struggled mightily. He didn't get his first win until the third to last race of the year. Uh, very big, uh, just massive letdown year for Kyle Busch's standards. I mean, ridiculous. And he was the defending champ. This year, obviously he got the clash win, but he's kind of had a pretty up and down year, and he's hasn't been dominant. He hasn't popped yet. Uh, he barely led any lap. I actually don't know if he's led any laps this year. I wouldn't. Know. I didn't look at that. But yeah, yeah. It's it's been very quiet. You haven't seen him up front. Mm-hmm. I think he had a decent. He was able to get a decent finish at Homestead, and obviously he got third last week. Uh, but he, I think he only had five or nine fastest laps and no laps led. You, he's got to do it this week if it's going to be worth playing him. But like you said, since they reconfigured, even. With his crappy season last year, uh, two races in the spring since the reconfig, average finish, two, including a win. So, it's just a guy. <laughs> and, and 56 fastest laps, 88.5 laps led in those two races on average, the highest driver rating, 130.5. It's a guy that you have to have exposure to, especially here. You don't want to be there with very little Kyle Busch when Kyle Busch goes off. I've been in that position, and it's just, you know it's going to happen eventually. You know it's going to happen whenever you don't have them. So I've gotten to a point where I I have to have him, especially whenever you're looking at stats like we're looking at this week. And he's not a, like some of these other guys, he's not a spring versus fall guy. If you take out the championship race and the last two fall races, Kyle Busch's average finish is 1.5. Obviously, he's got one win. So he is good at Phoenix, but he has to lead laps, and he has to be fast, and that has been an issue with uh, Joe Gibbs' equipment so far this year. It Unfortunately, I feel like it's still a kind of one of the riskiest plays up around with any of these guys that he's around, which is crazy when you look at his track history. Absolutely, and... It's just weird to put it that way, but again, he's somebody I'm going to have quite a bit of exposure on, especially in the GPP plays, but he's somebody that you'll want just a little bit of exposure to in cash scenarios just because it's Kyle Busch and his track history here. I would be very leery on going heavy, but I do want some. Yeah. Uh, somebody that we're both... Fairly high on this week. You're really high on. We've already talked about him uh, a little bit. Brad Kozlowski starting uh, first on the pole. He's $10,400. So get into why you're uh, so high on him. I think uh, we've mentioned it several times already. Uh, The equipment, he's been consistent this year. Um, Similar to Elliott, he was... He obviously didn't get the finish, but uh, he was... 
first? Was he first? Yeah, he was first going into turn three at Daytona 500. The road course, he was in the grass almost the whole day and finished fifth, I think. Um, I don't remember how he was at uh, Homestead. I don't remember what happened there. But obviously, he was super dominant at uh, Vegas last week. And uh, you take Kyle Larson off that, he's going to win that race. I mean, he was dialed in. The team seems to be dialed in. Penske as a whole is dialed in. Um, and he's pretty good at this at this track in the spring. Um He's had a little bit of issue in the spring in the reconfig. He does have an average uh, finish of 15th in those two races. Um, But you look at the spring, he jumps up to 6th. Oh, sorry, not spring, uh, fall. Yeah, so he has a lot better fall numbers here, but I'm on board with you with just how good he and his team have been this year where I think they can do more this time up front than maybe they are accustomed to and have a better finish that allows him to pay off his value. Because if he's up front and he's as fast as he's been all year, he's got the potential to get those performance points that would be really key to helping him achieve that value. And I'm not sold on him winning this race. We might see someone else win this race, someone like Chase, or maybe Larson goes back to back, or maybe Kyle Busch finally really gets it going this year. But... Um, given his starting position, the great pit stops, pit stop selection, uh, they're in a prime spot this year, this, this race, if they can keep it clean, which they should, I don't see why he can't, you know, get out there, lead, uh, you know, 30 something laps. That's not that much. Um, get 20 or so fastest laps. He's going to kind of, and if he can finish top five, he's going to kind of cruise to a five X value. It's not great, but he has that potential to lead 70 laps, 100 laps, and then you got to have him. Yeah, he's he's one of those guys, in most scenarios, you're going to want a decent bit of exposure to him because unlike Harvick, we've seen the potential for him to lead a lot of laps this year. So, like, we were pretty high on Harvick last week, starting at the pole, it didn't really pan out, but we've seen the speed consistently from Brad Kay and Team Penske where we're a little bit more confident in his ability this week. And he seems to be, last year and this year, they were, well, last year they were really good. Uh, one thing we haven't mentioned yet, they are going to be on a uh, different race package. So last uh, last week at Vegas, they were a 550-horsepower motor, and as Dell Earnhardt Jr. would say, a giant-ass spoiler on the back. They don't have that this week. They have a tiny spoiler and 750 horsepower. Um, I don't remember off the top of my head the exact tracks, but Brad, I think it was New Hampshire. Um, man, there was like two other tracks. Darlington. No, it wasn't Darlington. Dover, maybe. There was a couple tracks very similar it to Phoenix. Dover. Um, with the, the layout and the package, he dominated. There was one race. I think it was New Hampshire. He led like 300 something laps out of like 400. If you didn't have him, you were not winning any money. They have really. And then everyone, the other thing you got to consider too, we've kind of forgot to talk about. This is the championship race again this year. So everyone is really trying to get their cars dialed in for later in the year. Um, So he was in the championship four last year. Uh, They have really got the 750 horsepower package and low low downforce package dialed in this team that's one of the reasons why i'm real high on brad and he's somebody that if i was just looking at the numbers like i typically do it just doesn't stand out and you don't see it maybe but it's why we're here that's why we have the conversations is why we tune in to what we're doing is we want to be able to communicate what we're seeing and be able to point out when there's obvious things like we just talked about where Penske's been fast, all of the scenario just played out because these things matter week out, week in and week out, and that's the difference maker between cashing and not. Um, let's go on to the next guy on the list. It's Martin Truex Jr. Starts starting, fifth. yeah, he's starting fifth, ten one. He's in a he's in an interesting spot. Starting fifth, he's right in the middle of where you have a little bit upside, but there's. It's just an interesting spot for him. I'm I'm having a difficult time trying to fit him in lineups, but he's going to be somebody in a GPP scenario that, like some of the other guys that we've talked about, 
you're going to want some some of him sprinkled throughout because he's got the ability to take over races and get a lot of performance he's, points. Uh, he's won here too. Oh, absolutely. So um, he's he's not a slouch. Um, the biggest con- – but he's shown him – there's been times that Gibbs has looked good this year. They're just not quite as dialed in as they were at times last year. Uh, I, I feel like it would be – if you're going to play multiple entries, multiple lineups, I think it would be foolish to not have Truex in at least a one or two. But if you've got twenty dollars and you're playing some a handful of contests, he'd probably be one of the guys I would not have very much exposure to because he's. It's an interesting spot. He has some success here, but it's just somebody I'm not super high on, and not a lot of stuff just stands out to me this week with him. Yeah, it's. I think it's hard to make the case based on previous track data that you have to play Truex here compared to some other guys, just given the starting position, um, the salary and all that. It's, it's just, it kind of comes down to it's Truex there and it's Joe Gibbs equipment. If you're on, like you said, if you're only playing a couple lineups, you're doing some 50 fifties or what? Yeah. Maybe you don't, don't play them, but I I'm going to find a way to get him in a couple on purpose, like definitely build some around him because he does have that talent and this team can pop. And this could be a track that he leads, you know, a hundred laps on or something like that. Again, the data doesn't necessarily reflect that. Um, but you, I, he's just a guy I can't full fade his teammates right under him. I love full fading him, but you can't fade this guy either. <laughs> <laughs> Denny Hamlin, 9,900, starting third, so he's two places better than Truex. He's somebody that's been able to lead a lot of laps before. He has that upside. He's a former champion. He's won here, I believe. So how how do you look at uh, Denny Hamlin? Is it very similar because he's a, a teammate of Truex in a similar spot? What well, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm looking at him as almost similar plays. Yeah, I think uh, they are similar. Uh, it yeah. seems like Truex has been a little, at least if I'm looking at the spring since they reconfigured the last two, Truex has had better, he's just been faster. He's averaging 20.5 fast laps, only five and a half laps led, whereas Hamlin is only getting seven fastest laps and three and a half laps led. So he hasn't really been quite as dominant. His driver rating is a little lower, but his average finish is a little higher at 12.5. But 12.5 won't cut it this week. But if you look at the broader picture, even going back before the reconvig and all that, the last 10 races here, Denny Hamlin has seven top 10s. So he's somebody that has equipment, has the experience. We talked about the experience being key here. I would lend playing Denny Hamlin two times as much as I would Martin Truex just because he's got a little bit lower price tag. He's starting up a little bit closer, has a, the ability to get up a couple quick spots and take. Well, and, and this is where you, I think you're getting it from and why people have to take Denny Hamlin serious. Well, since they did, re, I am limiting this to the reconfig in the fall, including the championship race because he was in the championship race. So we have three race sample size. He is the number one driver according to driver rating 121.8 average finish of six including a win two top fives um and much better he's averaging 49 fastest laps and 47.3 laps led he's been a stud at this track it just seems to be more so in the fall so that's why i think you got to consider him in in these lineups but i think like you said he's very similar to truex it's kind of a kind of in a tough spot because there's no real PD upside. They got to get out front and And lead. we haven't seen him lead a million laps like we were accustomed to him doing. Denny's led some. He's looked okay, but yeah. it's not the same Denny Hamlin that we've seen. So we just want to be a little bit more cautious, but 9900 bucks starting third with the ability to lead as many laps as he's capable of, it's going to be difficult not to have him. GPPs, I want a decent bit of exposure because if it if he hits like we've talked about some of the other guys especially his his teammates those guys have the ability to lead a lot of laps and get those performance points it's just which one's going to be able to capture the, it. the hardest thing for me is just the pricing because i'm gonna have a guy 
one of the drivers above them, somewhere between Harvick and Brad. They're going to be in most lineups. Um, I don't think I would have, I mean, I might have a lineup that I build with Hamlin as maybe the top guy and whatnot, but if I'm just trying to build around and just build a balanced lineup, I'm looking at Truex, Hamlin, Larson, and Blaney all right there in that 9, 9K range. I personally, even though he has one less PD upside, he's a couple hundred bucks cheaper. Kyle Larson, the winner from last week, who's looked great all this year, I personally would want to put more of my lineups going towards Kyle Larson versus Denny Hamlin. Do you feel, are you in agreement there, or is that something, what do you think with that? Well, he's next on the list at 9,600, starting second. There are quite a bit of uh, things that I look at from Larson and I like he's got speed it's going to be challenging to pick and choose but this week I'm with you I think I'd rather have Larson he's coming off that win he's seems to have consistent equipment very fast uh the last five races since he missed uh, the second race here last year um, he's got four top tens three top fives and his average finishes seventh so he's got a lot of good races here and the only thing he hasn't done is lead a lot of laps, lead a lot of laps. And if he is able to do that because of the speed that Hendrick has this year, starting where he is because of his win last year, second place, he could get out front real quick. Here's the thing that I think people, and this is why I'm going to, why I said what I said in the last two spring races. So this again, same configuration. Kyle Larson did race in this uh, race last year. So he is, his dad is here. So two races, Average finish is fifth, and he including a top five, two top tens obviously. But this to me, and he is the sixth best uh, driver according to driver rating. But this is the stat that really stood out to me in those two races: average fast laps zero, average laps led one. He is in much better equipment, and he's getting an average finish of fifth without leading laps and without being fast. What is he gonna do? And Hendrick equipment coming off a race, he led what did you say 103 laps. I think is what it was. like, man, yeah. If it, there's a race for Larson, I think to win back to back, this is as good as any. It would be a scenario where I wouldn't bet against it because we've seen how we've talked about it so many times how Hendrick is just so quick. So starting up where he is, he's got the potential it's it's really enticing and i really want to have a decent bit of exposure because even if he's able to get a lot of lead some fastest or lead some laps get some fastest laps he doesn't even have to win the race as long as he's able to get some of those performance points yeah all right let's uh, we uh we've been going in quite quite a bit of detail with these top guys we need to move it on move it on along uh ryan blaney 9300 starting eighth Again, Penske equipment finally looked good last week. I had to pass a ton of cars to get there. A track that he's... He's so-so at. He's so-so. He he has really decent finishes here since he's uh, been in Penske equipment. Third, third, um, 37th, and 6th. So, I'm taking that as Penske equipment. He's got... He got the equipment he needs to be successful. He's 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 had some recent um, strong finishes here. That eighth place spot and his price tag is is enticing. Um, looking at the guys below him, they're kind of questionable, but there's more place differential. He's in an awkward spot. It's yeah, it's an awkward spot. I won't. Man, I mean, Rainey's Blaney's my guy now. I mean, he helped get me a good win. Larson's my guy. I mean, this guy, you know, uh, I, I can't say anything bad about him, but again, you can't necessarily go back to the well just because they did good for you at the previous track. Um, I think he has a little upside. I think he's playable. I just don't think he's going to be in very many of my lineups because there's some guys, like you said, down below who actually are also fast and have good a place differential upside. The one thing I would look at it though is he could be a complete, I guess, contrarian play if you were planning on playing in Joey Logano and going to Ryan Blaney because he is basically nineteen or eighteen hundred bucks cheaper, one spot less in P 
PD. So he could really pay off if you go that route. It's going to be a lot more challenging and it's a GPP play, but I'm just saying that would be something you could take a look at. Yeah. Like I said, I think I want to find ways to get Blaney in there. I just don't think he will be in a bunch of lineups because I think there are a few better options uh, further down the list and above them. Like you said, it's a tough spot. Okay, we'll move on down the list to 9,000. Uh, this I don't want to talk about this guy. Th- this guy, Eric Amarola, <laughs> really hurt last week when we played him. He was starting, I think, 28th and finished dead last. He's 32nd. A lot of people are going to go back to that well because of the place differential. We're kind of cautioning folks against that this week. Yeah, I just – you don't – he doesn't stick out in any of the real – stat sheet i mean he, well i shouldn't say that because he actually is pretty good here in the last two for the spring which makes this tough um he had does finish uh have an average finish the last two in the spring of sixth um including a top five but he's only averaging four and a half fastest laps and he did get uh 13 fastest laps or uh lap sleds sorry average so he had a, a spot where he kind of popped but usually he's starting somewhere around that 10th place spot. Um, I, I think a- Amarola is just the guy. If they can get good pit strategy, they could change things. But passing that many guys with what seems to be Stuart Haas being a little off the mark this year, I have a tough time playing it because there's some guys below him that I kind of like a little bit more, even though they don't have the same place, different, place differential upside. But the thing about Amarola he doesn't have to have the best finish for him to be worth it. So it's a that's why we're cautioning people. It's not a, a not a full fade by any means, and he could really help your lineups out a lot. I mean, he could burn you the other way if you don't have him. But I, it's a tough spot for me. Yeah, he's he's somebody I'm going to play, and I'm going to have a decent bit of exposure to. But it's definitely definitely a cautionary tale because. Where he's at, he's in the back. He could get into some chaotic situations. It's it's a track that lends to experience. He's going to be back there with guys that don't have a lot. It's really going to be interesting. I don't like it a lot. That's why we're cautioning people towards it. And we haven't seen, a, so far this year, no one is sticking out in my mind where they started in the rear, like actually started in the rear. They didn't get sent to the rear and come back. Like, it seems like they've had a bit more struggle getting to the front than they have um, what we saw some last year. So that's another reason why I'm a little bit more hesitant on Amarola because it's so far back and it doesn't take much to cut a cut, cut a tire around these inexperienced guys. Um, so I don't know. I, I'm really interested to see what happens with Amarola. He's probably going to be the highest owned driver, um, I would imagine, on the slate just because of that PD. But I think you can win. I think you'll be able to win money in DraftKings without playing him. Uh, that's my opinion this week. Well, we'll move on down the list to Alex <laughs> Bowman, 8,700, starting 21st. He's a guy, if you look at the track history here and some of the data, doesn't really stick out. He actually has uh, an average finish in the last sixth of almost 22nd place. So where he's starting at right there. There's some upside with the place differential. He does have two top tens and a top five over that same last seven race span. So, what are you looking at? I think I'm a. I think I like um, Bowman a little bit more than you do this week, and and I can understand why you're a little weary of him because of the, uh, the more recent track history. He does have a top ten here. I think in his first race. I think ever uh, driving for uh, Hendrick. I think when he was filling in for uh, Junior, Junior. Yeah. yeah. So it was a good showing. The if I, he's going to be in in some lineups because I I think he has that upside. I don't know how many yet. Um, but I'm the reason for playing him this week is he's looked good this year and Hendrick has looked good this year. And and he's not in a bad spot as far as the PD upside and the and the price range. Uh, again, I don't love this play, um, but I, I do. I personally, I do like Bowman. Yeah, he's he's a he's a GPP target. He he'd be even a, a decent cash game play if he is able to hit value. 
um, because of that place differential, I want to have a little bit of exposure in both. I wouldn't very advise to go very heavy in a cash scenario, but he's somebody that is very interesting where he's sitting yeah, and I with that place a differential. Decent pivot from Amarola too. So eighty five hundred Matty D. Yeah. Starting twentieth. Yeah. He's another guy very much like an Alex Bowman. Doesn't have a lot of stats just coming off the board at you. Where he's starting offers place differential. He's in Pinsky related equipment there at Wood Brothers. He's another interesting play this week. Yeah, uh, the thing, in my opinion, with Matt this week, they're in a big hole uh, as far as the point standings go for NASCAR. For the playoffs, yeah. Well, just, just, I mean, just in general, obviously playoffs, but just they're just way, way behind. They're, they're, you know, we're on that cusp where they were going to have to have a win. I think they can still obviously point their way in. There's enough races, um, but they are in a hole. And they need to have a string of really good finishes. I think they can do that here. I think they can get a decent finish. But I, I think they will be a little cautious on how aggressive that they go for it. I mean, obviously, if they have shown to be one of the dominant cars, for whatever reason, they may try to go for that win. Uh, you know, make maybe make a risky call just because of if it lines up that way. But I think overall, they're going to try to play a little cautious. They're just going to try to get a good top 15 finish. And move on down uh, down the track so i think he's a nice pivot off of bowman and the next guy we're going to talk talk about um because he does have some pd upside and he doesn't have to do too much but i don't necessarily love it for those tournaments because i don't think he's going to get a top eight or something like that i think they're just going to be more cautious than that he's somebody i want to play more of in gpps in my my scenario i think he's that Nice fade between Almirola, Bowman, and people that are going to be on Byron and Bell. And with that place differential, he's going to have decent ownership. It's not like he's not going to be or going to be completely faded. So he's interesting, very interesting, in my opinion. One of the most pivotal guys potentially this week, if you're looking at it from a price standpoint and lineup structure. It's just a, a guy that's in a very interesting spot, in my opinion. And that's why we uh, do this together because we have difference of opinion and people are going to see these races a little differently. And, and so instead of just watching one guy give you advice on the slate, now you get two different perspectives and you get to see where we have agreements and a little bit different uh, perspectives. Because like I said, I, I, I'm more cash in that play and you're more GPP, which I think is fine. I don't think anyone can go wrong with that. So play your side. <laughs> William Byron moving on down the list, 8,300. You alluded to uh, him starting 10th. It's going to, uh, he's been impressive and fast this year. So I really want to not miss the boat, but at the same time, this guy's, he knows how to win and he's been good here. He's never won here, but he's progressed and you continue to see that and we continue to talk about that at, the level this guy's performing this year, he's somebody you have to talk about every week, it seems like. Yeah, he doesn't have knock-you-off-your-feet kind of stats. Um, well, those last six it, races, he's got the three top tens, which is, yeah, is which is nice. Right. Most of those, he seems to be a little bit better in the fall. A little bit, not, not much. I take that back. He did win the 2017 Xfinity race here. So his but no one, cup wins. One, his one year in Xfinity, this, like we've talked about before, is this guy's progressed so fast. In 2016, he was in the trucks. In 2017, he was in Xfinity. And then he's had the last few years here in Cup. So he's still learning. Yeah. So kind of piggybacking off what you said, I like William Byron a lot this week, but it, I'm not basing this off of track history. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, obviously, because we don't have practice, we don't have qualifying anymore. We don't really know who's showing up to the track with what, how they're going to be running. We, we, we lost that any sort of edge. It is a little bit more random now. So to play William Byron this week, in my mind, it's based on what we've seen so far this year. Even you take that win away, you know, let's say he finished his second one. I mean, he was really good in that race. He's looked good in other races and, you know, even uh, last week. And then Hendrick overall, I think he's a guy that can get another top 10. I don't think he has to do that much to really 
be worth it. And because he's only 8,300, it gives you some options that you can kind of uh, really diversify your lineups. And he might go a little lower on just because he's only starting 10th. Yeah, he's somebody I want in GPP lineups especially because he offers the upside of a, of a win, if you will. Yeah. But he has a place differential ability ability to get out and then get those performance points. Somebody I want to sprinkle in, not somebody I'm heavy, super heavy on, but I don't want to miss the boat. Um, Christopher Bell starting 8,100 fourth place guy that can finish in the top 10, but starting fourth is going to be really hard for him to achieve value. Especially we already talked about this track being a place that I guess rewards experience. He doesn't have a ton of experience he has a ton of talent wouldn't be surprising if he did great here i just don't expect it especially starting fourth it doesn't have a lot of upside yeah he's coming off of a obviously a good finish um to be able to get that starting spot but he was in a similar starting spot going into homestead and we actually liked him there and he just didn't perform it it seems like they're still you know there's he's still young it's only his second year i think we're going to see some inconsistencies throughout the year but it's a tough, it's a tough, what makes this tough is because it is Christopher Bell. If someone else was down here starting fourth at 8,100, it's like, that's nah, probably a fade because you're just not looking for that around that price point. But it is Bell and he does have talent. He does have a win um, and he is in Joe Gibbs equipment. Again, I know we've been a little harsh on him for the year overall, but he's the guy who got them their lone win and he has looked pretty good. Road course, different track, but uh it's, it, you, I think you got to, if you're playing multiple lanes, you got to find a way to get them in, but it's, it is a tough play for me this week. Yeah. It, it's not going to be easy, but he's somebody that could pop. And the reason, the main reason why is because the guy right below him, Tyler Reddick, 7,900, starting 23rd. It, it's just like, that's too enticing because he also has, he's pretty, he, well, he had a bad race in the spring last year, but this is a track that he, I think he can do well at. I'm looking at it from just a sold DraftKings perspective. We're getting him at the same price tag last week where he started 11th. He's 12 spots back with the same price tag. That's a ton of place differential potential with the same price tag. You don't get that very often mm. in DraftKings, so that's why I'm all over him. He's somebody that has four top tens and four races and as an Xfinity uh, driver. So he has a little bit of experience there, but we've talked about the experience that's required here. He doesn't have a lot of that. He's the same boat Christopher Bell is, but from a just sole DK angle, he's the play out of the two mm -hmm. because of that place differential. He's not, he's gotten around the track fairly quickly in the cup. He's, I think, had some fastest laps and things of that nature. So he could pay out big time. And I would expect for him to be really chalky this week. I agree. Um, and he will be chalky in my lineups too. A guy, a guy that I think might surprise some people now. And I think he will end up in more lineups than he normally does. The guy next on the list, Kurt Bush, 7,700, starting 12th. And this is one of the reasons why I do like him. Hasn't been overly fast. Hasn't led any laps here the last two in the spring. But average finish, 6.5. Yeah, he was somebody that popped to me just quietly. I was looking at numbers, and he just kept on popping up and popping up. But it was kind of in the, the middle of all the data, and it wasn't up at the top, but it was consistent. And so he was somebody I put a check mark down and wanted to go back and look at. He typically starts and finishes around that 10th spot if you go through a lot of the data. Starting 12th at 7,700 with his ability to have the upside, we've seen him lead some laps this year already. They've He and his team have looked fairly consistent. He's somebody that could easily help you take down a tournament, help you make a really nice payday. Well, I think he, he the thing that I'm hopeful, maybe other people will see this too, but I'm hopeful is he just carries a low ownership. And so you he might just perform just a little bit better than uh, maybe rostering Tyler Reddick. And just that tiny bit better could be a big difference in you taking home a small payday versus a larger payday because no one else may have them. 
Well, to get some of the guys that we talked about for so long in the top of this um, salary bucket, if you will, those guys, you'll need some guys in the middle of the pack to fill your lineup with, and I think Kurt Busch could be one of the keys to help you get there. I think a guy that we may disagree on a little bit is the guy next on the list, Chase Briscoe, 7,500, starting 26th. I think you said you were pretty high on him again this week, correct? I wouldn't say high. I do like where he's at. But after having conversations with you throughout the week and kind of being disappointed after what I've seen to start the year, honestly, I don't know if it's Stuart Haas or just Chase Briscoe. But Combo I have, of the bow. Yeah, I I was impressed with his ability at the road course, and he had the little incident with the hood and all that, and he just, to me, hasn't performed, especially from a DraftKings angle, because he's starting so far back. You need you're you're basically rostering him for place differential, and he hasn't really P- provided yeah. that. Yeah, and um. Obviously, there's no cup data to go off here at Phoenix. Uh, I think he's been okay at Xfinity, which is one of the reasons why you initially did like him. But, yeah, the reason why I'm just hesitant and he would be kind of a strong caution for me is he's a rookie. You've already mentioned um, experience is really key at this track. I think that's why Kurt Busch has popped so well in our, our stats. He's been in a million of these races. Um, he's literally has seen it all and Chase hasn't seen this track at all in the cup equipment. He's got a bad pit uh, stall selection and Stuart Haas has just been slow overall. Yeah. There's, there's a couple other guys that have a little bit lower to price tag that I would feel a little bit more confident in rostering. I'm not fading Chase Briscoe and he's somebody in GPPs. I will continue to sprinkle in because it could, it could, pay out really well eventually and he's somebody that he's gonna pop at some point this year and he's somebody where he is in the starting grid that place differential is just too nice to pass up especially with that price tag yeah okay austin dylan 7400 starting 13th somebody i know you've talked about a few times over the year this week is a little bit different i think i'm i I don't know what to feel about austin dylan he he doesn't pop on the stat sheet this is not one of the best tracks for him uh, by any means. Let's see. I don't even see. Okay, so he ranks 22nd um, out of the driver rating in the spring since they reconfigured it with an average driver rating of 54.7. Average finish of 28.5. That's tough. Um, you go to the fall. He is better. Average finish 16th. Still only a driver rating of 70.2. Um, but we're not racing in the fall. We were racing in the spring, and he's been around a 12th place car this year so far. I, I don't see much upside. Maybe he just carries low ownership, and maybe he sneaks in and gets a seventh or sixth place finish and really helps you out. Um, I mean, we were, I think, both pretty high on him last week, just didn't really pan out the way we had hoped um and we thought that was a better track for him so uh i don't love austin dillon this week um if you want to be a little different in your lineups and you're kind of ending up around in that price range um he might be a nice pivot off briscoe because he will carry lower ownership and maybe gets a better finish overall Uh, but i think it's tough i basically am copying and pasting what you just said he there isn't anything that really just stands out and he where he's at and with the price tag, he, he would need a top 10 finish uh, to really achieve a solid value. And it's somebody that uh, could do it, but it's not likely based on what we've seen, um, unfortunately. So very leery of rostering him. I'm leery of rostering the next guy on the list too. Bubba Wallace. Yep. Yeah, he's starting 25th, 7,200. In my opinion, I'd much rather have a Bubba Wallace than Austin Dillon at that price tag, but I'm still not 100% confident in either situation. Yeah, I think on paper it's it's a much a it's, much more obvious play. Like, yeah, this is is way better. Um, but Bubba has been, uh, in my opinion, disappointing this year. Um, personally, I haven't been that surprised by it. I've been a little surprised because um, I thought that they were going to uh, 
that new equipment was going to be much better. And maybe it is, maybe he's just getting used to it and adjusting and had some bad breaks. It's, it's hard to know exactly the reasons for the struggles, but he's been around the average kind of Bubba Wallace statistics. And I just don't necessarily think that gets it done, but there's enough of a PD upside that you have to consider it. And that's what I'm looking at is strictly that place differential. And if he gets a, a top 15, it really isn't too difficult for him to reach value. And we really talked about it before where we think that that equipment could be a top 15 car. So something, especially in a GPP scenario, I'm having a little bit more exposure than uh, I would like, I think, whenever I'm building lineups to Bubba Wallace. Yeah, I mean, in the spring, his last two uh, finishes are average of 20.5. I mean... No, I mean, he's not a guy that in the last equipment was going to lead laps and get a ton of fast laps, so that's not surprising. But, I mean, if he gets that, okay, it's it's not terrible, but um, I'll start rostering Bubba Wallace when I can finally see some speed out of that team. Um, How are these guys? It seems like every week we'll talk about one, and then the next guy's right around them. It's like, and I, I don't understand. They just swapped rides. Eric Jones... 7,000, starting 14th. He, uh, similar to Austin Dillon, his average finish is 28.5 in the last two spring races here. Um, we both think that this is a tough play this week, even though he helped me do really well last week. Yeah, in my lineup. starting 14th, um, the upside you usually get with Eric Jones for the place differential, just where they've been kind of starting and whatnot this year it's not there and to think that he's going to go out and improve his finish it could happen but it's not as likely in my opinion so he's somebody i'm looking at maybe getting a 17th 18th position finish ultimately when it's all all the cards are, are, are shuffled and that's not enough for me to reach value it just doesn't have any real upside with that being said he might be a, a perfect candidate for a contrarian play in a tournament selection because if you're looking at guys around him, he has the least potential to reach value, in my opinion, than most of those guys. So complete shot in the dark, complete contrarian play, it could hit. Now, just to shift gears slightly, do you think we're going to see better finishes out of Eric Jones in this 43 than we saw from Bubba last year? Because he finished... I don't remember exactly where it was at, but uh, obviously it was pretty high. So it's probably like eighth or something like that. Let's see where where did he finish last last week? Um, well, Eric he jo- started here. He finished tenth. That was, I think, probably better than almost any Bubba Wallace finish from last year. And I don't think that that team made leaps and bounds. But that's pretty impressive to me. Well, in my opinion, Eric Jones is a solid driver. He's he's somebody that has really shown some talent over the years but he's not not one of the elite drivers that's why he hasn't been able to maintain a ride uh he's an old school kind of driver so it doesn't surprise me to be a little bit more aggressive and find some ways for the top 10 but bubble wallace is to me seems to be somebody that's developing not as quickly as i would think he would or given some of the opportunities he hasn't performed as strongly as i would expect him to but with him in this new ride, I'm really excited to kind of see how he progresses this year and ultimately the team, how they progress, just to see what Bub- what cards Bubba Wallace has really been dealt and see if he really can take that next step to ultimately win and be the face of NASCAR eventually. All right, and I think that will really kind of help us figure out who Eric Jones and Bubba Wallace is because they, um, I won't say they swapped rides because they technically didn't, um, but they both, uh, well, Jones was in Toyota equipment and Bubba Wall last year, and Bubba Wallace is in Toyota equipment this year. Affiliated with Joe Gibbs, slightly different, new team. Again, not a perfect comparison, but already, I mean, I know Eric Jones had a couple. He was looking good in the uh, 500 and got caught up in that early wreck. So, uh, but he's looked decent this year. I've been happy with what I've seen. I was surprised as heck. To, he finished 10th in the Vegas and he had a ton of PD upside. So it's a tough one because it's like, okay, well, you know, maybe he can, but if you just look at the data and you consider the track or the, the car, 
I feel like this is a tough play this week. It is. There's a couple guys that we're going to talk about here that we're a little bit higher on. Ross Chastain in that Chip Ganassi equipment starting sixty nine hundred or starting twenty second at sixty nine hundred. He's a guy I would f- feel more confident, and with that price tag and the equipment, just seems like he's in Larson's old old ride basically is what I'm getting at. Uh-huh. We saw him get speed out of that. Ross Chastain is no slouch. He's a race car driver for a reason. He's got the upside. He he could reach that 5X value without doing a whole bunch. So what are your thoughts there? My biggest hesitation with uh, rostering Chastain is what you kind of say is his strength. And it kind of is. He's aggressive. And that means he kind of gets into people sometimes. And this is a track that that can happen at. If he can keep it clean and let some other guys take themselves out, I think he can get a a top 20 for sure. Um, But I think he could even get a top uh, 15 or maybe right around 15th. And if he can do that at his price tag, that will help open the door for some of these higher price guys that will be up front leading laps. And I think there's some other guys a little lower and even some guys above them that might draw a little bit more attention. So maybe we can get Chastain a little bit lower ownership um, and get a little sneaky, but it is, in my opinion, still a little risky because of that aggressiveness. And he's not a rookie, but he's kind of a rookie. You know, this is his first full-time riot or season in, in the cup. I want to see a few more races out of him before I feel kind of confident rostering him, but this is a good uh, spot for him. Yeah. He's in a great spot to be able to, to, really pay off that price tag and and to reach value somebody i would want some exposure to in gpps that's that's for sure uh cole custer 6700 starting 24th so he's got a couple spots to uh, in pd upside to the positive versus chastain he does have a cup win last year at kentucky He's somebody I've gone to multiple weeks. He was the highest owned guy last year in most of the the, the tournaments which was really surprising to me um but again, he just completely pops. I, but Stuart Haas equipment hasn't been what we've thought it was going to be. We've talked about that multiple times. He's, but that price tag, that's to me the difference maker. The price tag and the place differential. Even getting a top 15 finish, he's easily able to reach value. I think out of the rest of the guys on this list, well, hmm. Maybe I shouldn't quite say that, but I'll I'll kind of finish my thought is I think he carries the highest finishing position upside out of the rest of the guys, even though some of these other guys have had better finishes than him so far this year. Um, I think if you just kind of look at the equipment, uh, the talent and all that other stuff, you, you got to like him a lot in this spot, but he has had some bad luck. And because of that, you know, like I mentioned earlier, they don't have a good pit stall. They're going to be blocked in going in and coming out with really good cars. So, uh, I mean, I'm going to be playing them, of course, because it's a great spot. But, man, it is it is I'm, – I'm leery just because of what I've seen so far with Custer. Well, going on down the list, uh, Ryan Newman, 6,600 starting 19th. I this, think I think this could be a sneaky play. I don't think it's really going to be sneaky. I think a lot of people are going to actually play Ryan Newman more this week just because he's got two wins here. So people are going to go look at the data, find where he's playing, see that place differential, that price tag, and it's all going to click. He's going to be the Cole Custer this week, in my opinion. Hmm. That would be interesting, because you do have to go back a little bit to find some of that data. 2017 was his last win here. And then before that? Uh, I think it was like 2002. 2000, way back <laughs> so, then. Yeah, it's been a while, so... Um, 2010. So 2010 and 2017. So within the almost yeah. the last decade. But. Um, different cars, different equipment. Uh, most people don't know that. I think you're right. He will be highly owned because he's only 6,600. And both of his wins were in the spring. I mean, I like Newman. I I, I, I kind of find it a little hard to believe that he'll be the one of the higher owned guys, but I was surprised as hell that Custer was as high as he w- was that one race, so... Um, I, I mean, if that's the case, it's a little harder to want to roster him. But I think it's in a, I think it's a decent spot. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to be involved 
a little bit more than normal with Ryan Newman just because of some of the history and some of the numbers I'm looking at and just because he's got the experience that we've talked so much about starting 19th and at that price tag at 6,600, it just offers a lot of upside. So I like Ryan Newman. Mm -hmm. I don't think I'm going to play him a whole bunch, but I really do like him a lot this week. Okay. Uh, Busher, I mean, I'm in agreement with Newman, but uh, let's get on down the list. Uh, Chris Busher, 6,400, starts 17th. Um, I like him again. I, I think it's a decent spot. Uh, obviously, I don't love it. I love it a little bit more PD, but um, he doesn't have to do that much to to be valuable. Yeah, and he's and, he, and he's had the upside this year. He has. He's really been fairly consistent and somebody that if you're playing in your lineups, you've really kind of liked a lot of the results that you've been getting with him. And he's starting 17th. It doesn't offer some of the upside that we've seen in a couple of the other previous races. It's going to be a little bit more challenging for him to reach value starting there, but with 6,400, if he can get a top 15 price tag, then we could see him, uh, or top 15 uh, finish, we could see him pay off that price tag. So somebody I want a little bit of exposure to, just not a lot. And I think a lot of these guys that we're getting ready to touch on really aren't guys that we're going to be exposed or have a lot of exposure to. I think most of the guys that we've talked about already are really where we're feeling confident in playing. Yeah, I think if we kind of start summarizing the, the rest of the guys, because there's not a ton of upside, I think McDowell is and maybe a nice pivot from some of these other guys because he has been decent this year. I think you got to show, and he was really valuable last year, um, but he was usually starting further back. I think, you know, he doesn't grade out well in our projections. I think that's a tough play. Anything you wanted to mention about McDowell that stuck out to you? No, yeah, he'd be a GPP play in my, in my scenarios. I think, I think really the, the lowest I'm really going to want to go and I'll go a little lower just to fit some guys in, but the, 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 play that I like the most is really the next guy, Corey LaJoy, 6,000, starting 33rd. Didn't work out last week. Had some trouble. Finished second to last. Um, I, I still think at some point he's going to, I don't want to say pop, but when you're starting that far back and you're in decent equipment, you can still get a mid-20s finish and it's exactly what your lineup needs. Yeah, and I think Daniel Suarez starting uh, 27th and 50, uh, for 5,900 is very similar with the play there so those two guys are guys i'm looking at daniel or i mean anthony alfredo 5800 starting 28 i like him as a driver i want to see success but experience we've talked about it yeah he doesn't have it at all right and any series so it's very difficult to even think about rostering him here i would i know some people might from other channels might put point you to him i wouldn't touch him basically i want to just you know, I want to have a little confidence in my lineup. I don't want to just be throwing these random numbers out, uh, random guys out, um, and hoping that it sticks. Sometimes it works out, but I, I want to see a little bit. We we He needs time to be able to prove it to us. Yeah. Ryan Priest and Stenhouse, both guys starting in the top 15. They have low price tags, but there's not a lot of upside there. Uh, it's going to be difficult, but... If you need to, or if you're looking to fit some of those upper uh, tier guys into your lineups, these guys could be placed, but GPP only. If if they get a good finish, I mean, really, I think Stenhouse is a guy just because of how they are. They might get a, some a few cheap uh, laps led, maybe a couple fastest laps, um, but you're hoping that he's able to kind of maintain that starting position. Um, and get a good finish. I think that's tough. And same thing with Ryan Priest. He's had good finishes, so maybe this does play out. Maybe he gets overlooked some because, like you said, there's really no obvious PD upside. Um, but because they're so cheap and they are starting so good, if, they, if they're able to maintain that, they'll be worth it because of what they allow the rest of your lineups to do. But, again, I don't love – playing those guys at all no that scenario would be the only way i would approach it and then really on the list i'm really only seeing two guys that i would even consider pump plays uh, justin haley and bj mcleod the bottom dollar guy but you want to touch on justin haley 5029th yeah i mean he's he's a good uh racer i mean he's got talent but he's just not in great equipment Finally, we're getting uh, uh, him in a spot where he's not starting so high, so there's a little PD upside now. Uh, so I think he can work because he is only 5,000. 
you're getting a little bit more of a brand name around some of these other guys in that price range. So he can work. He definitely can work. Uh, if he's able to get a 20th place finish, you'll take that to the bank all day. Um, but it is still questionable because, again, he's not in the best equipment. He's racing around guys uh, that he's not going to be that much better than. So the chances of him cutting a tire or getting spin out or something like that is going to go way up. And, again, it's a punt play. And the other punt play I would even suggest, and I'm not really going to probably play too much, is B.J. McLeod, 4,500, starting 30th. He's a guy has a lot of experience, is a great traditional race car driver, knows a lot about how to get around tracks, and it has the experience. He just doesn't have the equipment that would lend to having a solid finish but starting as far back as he is with that price tag even like a 27th place finish would most likely almost get you to value so there's well and that's going to open the that's going to open the door for um you to fit in a guy like elliot maybe brad and larson and you can fit them in and then you can still get some decent mid-range guys so you're not sacrificing everything but again you're playing mcleod I think in, for him to really work out, and this is questionable um, because this is a fast track, if he's able to stay on the lead lap or maybe be the first guy a lap down when they throw the competition caution, and these, some of these other guys like the Quinn House, the Yaleys, the Davisons, you know, they'll most likely go a lap down. If he can stay in front of them, then he's got a good, stop, a good shot at least finishing where he's at, which you want a little bit better, but at that point, some of these guys up front, they wreck, or if they go a couple laps down for whatever reason, he can maybe pass them. And then that's how that's his path to being valuable for our lineups. Not, not, and you never have fun, you know, and you never feel confident doing that. No, so it's, <laughs> it's one of those, those GPP scenarios that, uh, every once in a blue moon will hit, but it's not something I'm banking on from week to week. Yeah. Well, that was the, the last of the guys. Uh, any little things um, that I did uh, that you wanted to mention to our viewers, or anything that stood out to you that maybe I didn't let you touch on? <laughs> no, we covered a lot, and I think we I touched on a lot of things that we uh, wanted to go over. Uh, you led into the track reconfiguration. That's a big thing that uh, I don't know if folks that don't really follow the sport understand how impactful some of this information is. Um, so we really go deep, and obviously this is probably one of the longer podcasts we have because there's a lot of stuff that we wanted to bring to your attention because we know the sport. We know that you don't know everything about it. Some of you do. Some of you might know more than us. Please let us know. We yeah. we want feedback. We want to be interactive. We want that conversation. And, and one of the reasons why this podcast is a little longer is because now now we're starting to get some season data. And now we can see, okay, who's coming in hot, who's off a little bit. And that forces us to say, okay, we have to consider the momentum of this season. And then we have to consider the track data, um, you know, from previous races um, and any other data that we can pull from. And it, it takes a little bit longer, but it's it's very important. You don't want to skimp over this because I think momentum is, is real key in, in this sport. Yeah, so it's something that we spend a lot of time on throughout the week, have a lot of conversations and we put it all together here. We put it all together in the race guide, that race guide. We really advise you to pair that stack that with this podcast, um, and utilize it as a reference. Use it. It, it really is something that we've worked hard on as a, basically a visual reference that highlights a lot of the things that we uh, talked about here. It's a really good summary and we spend time to make sure that you get valuable information out of it. So if you're listening up to this point, you care about these lineups, you care about all this stuff and you have found our information at least somewhat valuable to stick around this long. So if you have give yourself an award by giving us a like, subscribing so that way we can do this every week and then give us a comment on how your lineups do or if you have questions like you said before the lineups drop us a comment um we want to help you out we want to help you do what i was able to do last week yeah winning money is what it's uh always it's always fun when you do that and we're excited we wanted to we want to continue to help you along if you're listening uh on on uh on the podcast 
I guess, off YouTube. If you're listening on Apple, go ahead and uh, like like us there. Give us five stars. Um, if you are listening on Spotify, follow us there. Download it. Uh, we really want to, like we've said multiple times, get your input. So wherever you're uh, watching, listening, please leave a comment. Just be active with us. We want that uh, uh, that conversation. And and be sure also, we'll put this in the description. Um, give us a follow on Twitter if you're not, because we haven't put out our dark horse pick dark horse pick yet. And two races ago, we had William Byron and he won the race. And uh, I forget the exact odds, but had you take him even a top five, it would have been really good if you're more into just straight up betting. Um, so we'll, we'll put that out. Um, we usually put that out on Sunday, uh, for our Patreon and for our, uh, Twitter followers. So everything we just talked about, all those links are down below in the description. Please subscribe here on YouTube and give us a follow. But until next time, I think we're done here. What do you think? That's it. Thank you.